On this program, time and again, we've looked into the history of important places and events from the area. But one thing we really haven't done is to look into the history of a concept. We'll get ready, because on this episode, that's exactly what we're going to do as we look into the history of sustainable farming from the area on this episode of It's Your History. Brand new executive director of the Anoka County Historical Society gives us an overview of the history of sustainable farming in Anoka County by way of the Anoka State Hospital. The State Hospital of Anoka, known as the Anoka State Asylum at its inception, was established by the state legislature in 1899 as a custodial hospital. This meant that patients were admitted not with the intention of rehabilitation, but simply to live in a safe environment separated from the rest of society. Most often, the location for these facilities was chosen based on a tranquil location to provide serenity and scenery, open space, and privacy from the outside world. Thomas Kirkbride, the superintendent for the Pennsylvania Hospital for the Insane in the mid-1880s, declared that at least 100 acres of land was necessary to provide space for farming, gardening, exercise, and other outdoor labors. The facility at Anoka not only used these recommendations, but also improved upon them by treating the curable and incurable patients together in a cottage system that allowed for smaller groups of 50 to 70 people to live together rather than huge impersonal buildings. The Anoka facility opened 16 years later at its present location on 648 acres along the Rum River, 300 of which were in cultivation. By 1925, the residents had helped build a milk house, blacksmith shop, slaughterhouse, several greenhouses, and four silos to manage the demand of ever-increasing food production. The increasing demand for food mirrors the rise in population, which, in 1930, had topped 1,000 residents. Similarly, it mirrored the change in farm management and local food production, as by 1966, the farm complex and acreage had been eliminated. During those first two years, back in the early 1900s, residents spent 15,435 workdays employed as farm help. During the first years of food production, residents and staff ate meals of hash, roast beef, potatoes, corn, beef, cabbage, pickles, stew, and a variety of cakes and rolls. Milk was included with most meals. By 1904, patients were offered pork and codfish, as well as beef products, with slightly more variety in vegetables. In 1906, staff needs had risen to include a cook, paid $45 a month, baker, the superintendent's cook, farmer, gardener, and the women's cottage cook, who made only $25 per month. A year later, the menu specifically mentions the addition of muskmelon, baked beans, beets, and sliced tomatoes, illustrating the advances made in producing food on site. Hastings ran a very similar business and spent $122 to Anoka's $98 per person per year in 1911 to 1912. With the advent of World War I in 1914, the price of food doubled and in some cases tripled. The state added a service building with a kitchen, bakery, and employee dining room, as well as the vegetable house, smokehouse, and a new dairy barn and silo. The farm operation managed 70 head of cattle and produced 200 tons of hay, cultivating roughly half of the land site. Despite the increasing costs associated with operation of the facility, Anoka maintained its reputation for being a low-cost per capita hospital spending only $109 in 1915 per person. In 1930, at the outset of the Great Depression, staff size had grown to the point where the food production and farm management split apart and were listed separately as the Farm and Garden Department and the Culinary Department, employing five and six people respectively. 
and cultivated acreage had grown as a result of leasing 200 extra acres. The Works Progress Administration, or WPA, spent several years on the property, rebuilding the barn, an enclosure for poultry, replacing the dairy barn floors, and creating a new 14 by 30 foot enclosure for the herd sires. These efforts would mark the end of the heyday in on-site farming for the Anoka Asylum. A name change to the state hospital became official, and an era of deterioration in both food and facilities would span the next 20 years. As care improved using new methods of treating the mentally ill in the 1960s, so the farm gates would close for good in 1966. That's some great data from somebody who would certainly know. After the break, we'll get a chance to hear about how some of those practices were implemented from some of the former staff on It's Your History. What I like about QCTV is that I can watch local programming even when I'm away at school in Boston. I just go to QCTV.org and I can find out what is happening in Anoka, Anover, Ramsey, and Champlin. This summer I will get to see local graduations, parades, and community events. Thanks QCTV! Want to know what is going on in your city hall? Watch News and Views. Catherine, Corey, Noah, Matt, and Leslie will keep you informed and up to date on city activities. I hope you're enjoying our local programming right here on QCTV. Coming up next, we'll explore the old Anoka State Hospital as a microcosm for sustainable farming in Anoka County. Who better to hear it from than the former staff? Well, they, they had a, a big population when I first went there. They, were, uh, they had their own farm. They grew all their own vegetables. They canned and froze vegetables. And they had a dairy. And they also raised hogs. The only thing they bought was beef, I think. Well, they said that it was self uh, produced. It was, uh, the, the, the place was self, what do you call it? Sufficient. Self sufficient, yeah. So but I think they must have had to buy some things, like sugar and coffee and stuff like that. See, the, the hospital operated completely self, it was a very inexpensive operation. They raised all their own vegetables, they had a huge dairy herd. Um, in fact, the dairy herd thing I think is funny. The farmer legislators criticized the hospital for how poorly they were running their barns, so then they made a decided effort to improve the quality of the herds and then the hospital was making surplus mu uh, milk, which they were selling on the market. So by the time I came, the dairy herd had been shut down. But they grew potatoes and rutabaggies and had brit cellars. And uh, much of the <clears throat> produce uh, you know, that was the supply to at, at the kitchen for the meals was raised actually on the farm. The farm was right close by, and uh, as I recall, uh, there was a golf course right close by. Greenhaven, I think the name of the golf course was. I don't know if it still exists there or not, but uh, uh, I remember we just would cut through the farm. They did raise corn and wheat. I think some of it was sold in the farmer's market, but. Uh, much of the produce and tomatoes, cucumbers? Well, we put out a lot of peanut butter cups for snacks. Um, that was just one part that I do remember well because the patients loved those peanut butter, little med cups, 30cc med cups with peanut butter because they put them out for the squirrels and we had literally squirrels all over, squirrels all over the campus. They were eating well off the peanut butter and getting quite fat. Um, we had a lot of food for the patients. There was no limit 
on what they could eat. Um, they had meat and potatoes, vegetable uh, dessert. Um, over in the central dining room, it was infrequent that somebody needed a tray to be delivered to the unit in the food truck, but that did happen. Um, we tried to get everybody over to eat, and at the end, um, after everybody had gone through the serving line, they would call out seconds, and then everybody would come back and eat some more. Today, it's uh, people are more aware of the amount of calories that they serve the patients, so the um, food isn't as abundant in amount that is served. It wasn't uncommon then for people to gain weight, but they gain weight today too because of the side effects from the meds. So yeah. most people like the food um, and they ate pretty well. The staff would go over and eat the meals too. That was if you had to go with the patients to the meal, then you had the meal and you sat down and ate too. I thought it, would, it was great. I like to go. Or they had, you know, put bread in a can in the day room and they'd be having starting some hooch. I mean, they'd get some booze started in the day room. It's always amazing to hear about how things were done in that time. And it's always great to hear about it from the people who were there to do it. Well, coming up next, we'll take a look at how the history bridges to the present as we visit a centennial farm. Coming up next on It's Your History. I finally got diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia when I was 17, when I was in the 11th grade. My symptoms include auditory hallucinations, paranoia, religious delusions, and seeing things. It's not scary, it's not weird, it's been happening ever since, as long as I can remember. People only pay attention to the stigma or the bad reputation of having a mental illness, but what they don't realize is that people with mental illnesses are still people. I work as a mixed sound engineer. I run my own facility in downtown Minneapolis. All I do is work with music, either recording, mixing, or mastering, and that's my only source of income right now, and I'm doing it. A success story is someone that is self-sufficient and independent, and I am very much a success story. In this next segment, we'll visit a place that bridges history and the present as we visit Bruce Bacon of Garden Farm in Ramsey, Minnesota. I'm here today with Bruce Bacon of the Crandall Garden Farm. It's a century farm that's been in the family for more than a century. So how did you come to own the property? Well, uh, elder care. I took care of my, my bachelor great uncle, Uncle Joe Crandall. Uh, in 1970, I moved out here and he was needing help when he was driving to town every once in a while. He'd bounce his car off of a parked car. <laughs> and his sister, my Aunt Ada, and my mom, and cousin Marion all agreed that something had to be done to help Uncle Joe manage, because he was 80 years old. And is that when you decided to get into the organic farming? And the boys. We wanted our boys to have healthy food, and my wife and I were in agreement on that. So that's one reason we moved out here, to have a garden. And there wasn't an organic gardening uh, organization until a few years later, I don't know, here, 74. So organic Growers and Buyers Association started with an annual meeting, and I would go to that. And soil law was interesting me because I was studying social science when I was in college, and I didn't have an agriculture background. I was just picking it up as a hobby. And, and from Uncle Joe, and it was a family legacy, but 
but they weren't gardeners. They gardened for the house, mm -hmm. and they sold some things when they had extra. But uh, that you moved into the organic farming as oh, a way to stabilize yes. the family farm. Yeah, well, and also because uh, uh, we wanted healthy food for our children. I mean, everybody loves their children, so then it's a question: what do you feed them? And we thought it was clear that we didn't want to feed them things that had been grown or sprayed with poisons. I mean, is this a complicated idea? I don't think so. I didn't think so then, and I still don't. So Got how it. much land is actually here? There's uh, 95 acres. My cousin has got eight of it, and uh, and his dad helped my uncle. And so we, when, when, when we changed ownership, then he has some too for helping. And uh, But my garden is only, uh, it started out less than an acre, and now it's maybe only a couple acres, maybe three at the most. And uh, 1993, I think, was my best year. I grossed 33,000 on an acre of garden with four people helping, but uh, 25,000 of that went for labor and then uh, some more for seeds and something. So, so it, for me, it's always been kind of a break even was the goal. If I broke even, then I wasn't having to spend money to grow this delicious, great, healthy food for people that wanted it or needed it. And, uh, and, and so that's still my economic goal. And we're bumping on it this year. It's, now it's the middle of the summer, like week 14, I think. And the first 10 or 12 weeks, there's no invoices. So it's my money paying the garden help. And, and, and so now, from now to the end of freeze up, is, my, is, is the only opportunity I have to earn my $3,500 back, which went in for labor so far. You're working with some soil conservation groups, though, too, right? I am, because uh, it was clear to me that this was a very vital, healthy growing condition, the plants. And the chefs, the chefs told me that my product had the longest shelf life of, of most of the other growers that they were buying from. For them, it's good, because then they get to use it for several days longer. And uh, my basil, in particular, they said, had the longest shelf life of any that they'd seen. And I liked growing these specialty crops that nobody else was growing. Uh, like I don't, I started out growing Roma tomatoes, but that, everybody's growing tomatoes. So I don't grow potatoes, everybody's growing potatoes. You can get them for a dollar a pound at the co-op. I try and grow things that are specialty, like French sorrel, nobody else is growing that, I'm selling that at the Seward co-op, because nobody else had it. Who was the first owner of the property? Oh, I don't know. It was in the 1870s, I think, or 80s. Uh, it's on the deed, I guess, but I, I'd never, I don't have it memorized. <laughs> they bought it from a guy, I think, named Vic Ryther, who built the barn and the house in 1909, and they bought it in 1913. My, my, my great-grandmother, Elizabeth Ann Keeler, and Benjamin Herbert Crandall, and uh, Elizabeth Ann Keeler was from a family of eight, I think it was, five of which who settled around here and have descendants still here. So that's why I say I got 100 cousins within five sure. miles. They had big families. I'm an only child. But uh, no fault of my mom. She explained to me one time she tried not to leave me alone. <laughs> uh, bless her heart. And she's the one that taught me the, the love of the place, really, by getting me involved with elder care. And her mother, my grandmother, lived here some. And then a younger sister, Ada, when her husband died in, in the city, sold her house and put up the money to remodel the old house, put in running water. That was a big plus. But for Uncle Joe, it was too late. In 87 or 78, we got that done. But he had to go in the nursing home because he was getting incontinent, and I couldn't deal with that too. And I was splitting my time with my wife and family in the cities. Sure. So, but it was, uh, it was a way to, and, and she and I would go to take my grandma to church over at Trotbrook Gospel Hall, where I still get once in a while, get to see my cousins, and uh, and uh, sounds good. I really appreciate your time, Bruce. Well, it's always great to get out and visit Bruce on the farm. Now we've seen that gap bridged from the history to the present, but bridge to what? We'll find out next on It's Your History.
What? What the? What are you doing in my car? Oh, hi there, I'm just along for the ride. I was hiding in that piece of wood that you just picked up. I'm assuming you're having a campfire. Well, I'll, I'll just tag along and check out your healthy trees, maybe. Infest them and kill them off. <laughs> no big deal. This is not happening. Get out of my car. No, I don't think I will. No, no. Get out of my car. No. Right now, no. get out. No. Shoo. No. no. What, what are you doing? What, what are you doing? No. No, no! Oh. Oh. That's not nice! You could be unknowingly spreading emerald ash borer. By moving firewood and logs from other areas, you could be spreading this devious little insect, killing our beautiful ash trees. Don't spread emerald ash borer. Buy firewood where you burn it. Hello, I'm Anton Egink, and these are my brothers, Joe Egink, Ronnie Egink, Paul Egink, and Alphonse Egink, and we're originally from Holland. But when we are in America, we watch local programming, and our favorite, QCTV. QCTV rocks! Okay, one more time. One more time. Now that we've studied the history of sustainable farming in Anoka County and seen how farms like Bruce Bacon's are the bridge between our history and present, it's time to take a look at what that bridges to as we study the delivery mechanism for farmers. A CSA, it stands for Community Supported Agriculture. It really is a um, bridging um, a, a partnership, a direct relationship uh, for a consumer to a farmer. It's different from a farmer's market, for example, or shopping at a co-op in that uh, members uh, pay up front for the whole season and by doing that they are actually, actually sharing the risk of farming um, and the rewards, um, so you get both. But it's, um, it is a real way of standing in solidarity and support of small family farmers, um, local farmers, and who are taking on risk um, and sharing in that. Um, uh, so it's, it's a real um, meaningful way to have a relationship with the farm and also to support um, local family farm. It's community supported agriculture, so it's basically a farm, a small, usually small family farm um, that, you know, is growing product, trying to get product to market, and uh, consumers can buy shares, so they buy And so it's just supporting that whole system farther down the line. CSA members have two things in common, um, largely, um, over, in a broad stroke way. One is they want to have pure, local, organic, uh, beautiful food um, and want for, to support their local uh, family farms in their area. Um, and with the CSA, um, it's a way to not only support those farmers, but also um, support them 
with the viewpoint that they are real stewards. Um, they're on the front lines um, in environmental stewardship of the land and the air and the water and so it's a way to um, also support that whole um, movement um, as well. It's just a connection that fits with our mission, fits really well, you know, knowing um, we like for we like for our owners to be able to make connections with farmers. It really, I think, that's what changes the way people view the world. It's the way that it's those connections that you can talk to them about factory farming and you know how terrible that is and that kind of thing. And people will hear it, but it's not. They just they don't make that connection until they actually reach out and connect with a real farmer and they see the difference and, they, and it moves something with, within them, I think, and that slowly is what changes the way people see um, where their food comes from and what they choose to eat and put in their bodies. So. I think that a lot of us are removed. Well, we've seen where the produce comes from, and now we've seen where it's gonna go. More of It's Your History after the break. What is that guy's problem? That was the most irresponsible this aggression will not stand, man. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not sure what's about to happen next, but we're already off to a really bad start. And this situation is only going to escalate. So let's back up, figure out what could have been done differently to avoid this. Sixty-six percent of traffic fatalities are caused by aggressive driving. If you witness somebody who's a driving aggressively, don't take it personally. Take a breath, think about this, calm down. That'll get your heart rate lower and you'll better control your emotions. Also, don't engage with people by staring at them, looking at other drivers, or responding to their provocative behavior. They might just be trying to get a rise out of you. Be the level-headed person, be the smart person. Remember, half of drivers who get provoked are going to respond with their own aggressive behavior towards you. And do you really want to be stuck now in that confrontation? And statistically, an increasing number of these incidents involve a firearm. And do you want to be stuck in that kind of a situation? Stay smart on the road. Keep in mind the potential consequences. It's not worth winding up in prison or worse yet, dead. See you out there on the road. Not every farmer still utilizes methods used in the past, but the ones that do seem to be flourishing now in a time where people seem to be more and more conscious of what goes into their foods and therefore their bodies. Thanks for joining us for this episode of It's Your History where we've explored the history of sustainable farming in the area. For QCTV, I'm Matt Overstreet.